good to see you, Tony. Thank you for making time for us. Oh, my pleasure. Um, Elegance, you know, this film kind of hit me hard in a lot of ways, um, in a way that I wasn't expecting. And I think one of the reasons why is because it is so personal. And one of the things that that I always ask directors, particularly when they are, you know, making a film that's about their life, how do you determine what, how, how far to go, how true to be? Um, are there ever, is there ever any impulse to kind of hold back things that maybe are too personal? Uh, well, I mean, it's a really uh, great question. Sure. Uh, I guess it, to be specific in this film, the one thing I've always been most worried about is how uh, the Inez character that's based off of my mother is uh, received by audiences. Um, and really, you know, I definitely had versions of the script where they had a more kind of idealized outcome. And I think for the autobiographical film, the assumption is that you're just recalling what happened to you and you, you write it into this final draft and then you get some money and you just restage what happened. And that's not it at all. In reality, you know, this is about the essence of emotional truth. And ultimately, what does what, from what happened, what does it actually all mean to you as a human being? So when I looked at it that way, you know, my mom, unfortunately, we never, at the conversation that happens at the end where she talks about her you know, inability to love him for who he is, but loves him anyway, I've had that conversation with my mom. That's the last conversation we had before she passed. So the emotional truth of that was that when we had that conversation, I don't know, it took me 30 plus years to get to it. And I was terrified of it because I really thought it was going to destroy me when she acknowledged what I'd already known to be true. But when she said it, it didn't destroy me because I knew that I had done what I needed to do to love myself, you know? And that's the essence of emotional truth. That's why this movie exists, is to let, you know, in part to let queer kids know and let anyone who's ever been kind of, you know, abandoned or overlooked, disregarded know you are enough. The fact that you survived that experience means that you have the tools to continue and to find the love that you deserve, you know? So, you know, that's kind of the, the, the nature of the, for me, the autobiographical film. It's all about what did I learn from what happened to me? And then from there is when I start to imagine the scenes and the dynamics that could make that accessible to an audience. And so in that, in that frame, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting that, that, that the, the final test of a Marine is that thing that they call the crucible. Yes. Um, um, and I feel like that is such an apt metaphor mm. for what this, for what your character, for what Ellis, for what Ellis goes through. Right. It was, is that metaphor something that kind of stood out to you when you were, you know, crafting the script? For sure. I mean, you know, the beauty of this was like, having experienced it maybe a little over 10 years prior, maybe like 13 years, I think it was when I, no, I started the script in 2017. I finished the Marines in 2010. Oh my God, so seven years, wow, it's even less time. Um, but um, yeah, like to that earlier point about the essence of emotional truth, you know, the definition of the word crucible, I'm not gonna bore you with it, but it really is the kind of apex of one's of one's of a moment in someone's life is the crucible it's the peak it's the climax you know and when I look back at my time in the Marine Corps and writing this I remember how you know as a gay gay boy you know first of all my name is Elegance right that's my given born name any room I've ever gone into everybody has assumed that I'm gay in that room before ever meeting me and they're absolutely right they were 100% accurate you know so and unfortunately, that assumption led to a world within which people underestimated me on so many different levels, but, you know, really specifically on that physical level, right? Because so much of masculinity in our society is defined through the physical. So, you know, when I went into the crucible, I was terrified. All that trauma of, like, not being enough of a boy, not being masculine enough, not people assume that you're weak. And then you start to assume that you, you're, you can't physically do it. And I was, so it wasn't just about scaling the obstacle for me. The obstacle became the physical embodiment of all of the homophobia that I had dealt with, the ways that homophobia had made me doubt myself. And then 
so to rewrite it, right, to come back to it in this film, you know, that was the essence of emotional truth. And the beautiful thing about The Crucible for me is that when I was weak, people lifted me up and made sure I finished. When they were weak, I did it for them. And that interconnectedness, this idea that as a Marine, we are tasked with the responsibility to protect the Marine to our left and to our right, holistically. You can't pass the crucible unless you demonstrate those skills. This is why I made the movie. I really do believe that every human being, all 8 billion of us, depend on one another for survival. So the crucible was the moment that that became true, that I, I could see that truth. And that's why I put it in the film the way that I did. Um, so, so Jeremy Pope, yes. who has this uh, uh, unenviable task of anchoring this film, mm. what did you see in him that made him the person to, to do this? Um, well, I mean, first of all, Jeremy is a light. He's the type of individual that if you are lucky enough to be in a room with him, he doesn't have to say a word from, for you. And he just glows. Whatever corner he's in, he's just emanating light and warmth. And that was important to me because I'm the type of director, I'm a very personable, hands-on kind of guy, you know? So I needed somebody that could meet me halfway. Um, another thing about Jeremy is that he's clearly a leader, right? His decision to be an out queer black actor is a form of leadership that I think this industry needs and our society needs. You know, as a black gay man, my identity, you know, we don't get to be the heroes of movies very often. So, but I love movies and television. So I'm literally looking for myself my whole life. I just ran into Revenge of the Nerds again. And I saw that movie when I was probably like four or five years old the first time. And Lamar is this big character in it. And I, when, he, when I saw it again recently, I was like, oh my God, I love this character. This character is a huge part of who I am. And I just totally forgotten that I was introduced to him in my early childhood. And that's what it's like for Black gays when we watch movies, you know? And Jeremy and I would talk often about what it would have meant to us to have a character like Ellis French. So for me, Jeremy's boldness and courage and being true in his identity as the star that he is, it made him essential. I could not do this movie with someone who was not out Black and queer. You know, Black gay men, one out of two of us will be HIV positive eight times more likely to commit uh, suicide, eight times more likely to be homeless. We have a certain type of hell to pay to become ourselves in this world. And it was really important to me that I had a phenomenal talent. And that's the last thing. I call it the Kate Blanchett test. I don't mean anything by it. You know, Kate is, she's a beast. She's an icon. I love Kate Blanchett. I want to work with her desperately. But that, that idea that an actor can be in a scene by themselves just them, the camera, the production design, the costume and the lighting. And from emoting, you can understand where they've come from and anticipate where they're going. It's totally compelling. Jeremy has that in spades. When you watch him listen to someone speak, you are reading, it's literary, what's going on in his face. Those eyes are just the you know, little pools of emo you know, emotion in each beat is like a stone being thrown onto a lake. You know, he's, he's a, a, a poetry emotion. I, I find it so interesting that you say that because there are moments in this film that are so quiet and so, mm -hmm. so, so where everything, you just allow the camera to just linger on the actor's faces. Mm -hmm. um, were, were those types of choices, were you, did you have kind of a visual in your mind of, of how you wanted this to look? Yes, for sure. Um, you know, like we're, when it comes down to it, you know, don't ask, don't tell me I've gotten its name in like the 90s, but in actuality, queer service members were forced to serve in oppressive silence for almost 80 years cumulatively. So, and there's really not a lot of content about this. So Lachlan Mill and I, you know, we're very intentional about wanting to make a statement. So when we're in French's point of view, this is like, a European, you know, art house movie, like a Beau Travail, right? It's a handheld camera, very subjective and contemplative camera. But when we see French in the world, it's like a military action film. It's, you know, Full Metal Jacket, it's Jarhead. And really what we're trying to say is that queer service members in those 80 years, we're making a visual statement, a visual language that says the shaky ground that we stood on that whole time, right? So that's the first thing is that the camera has to be 
embodied as the character, right? My goal as a filmmaker is to bring the audience to a place they could never go without me, right? So how do I place you within the skin of the other? That subjective and contemplative camera work is a part of it. Secondarily, when you have, I've never, this is my first time working with a troupe of professional actors. Most of my short films and my document, my documentary peer kids, they're not actors, you know? So once I got on set, I realized that I'm more interested in showing than telling. And when you have performers who have the ability to convey so much to their physicality and their thoughtfulness, why not lean into that? Why not allow the camera? And, and I guess the really last thing is this, is this is a movie that is very much around the contours of male intimacy and about a character, you know, the lead character, French, he comes from a transactional background of a, being an out gay man, right? If you like, if you do something for me as a man, then you must want to sleep with me, right? And he learns that that's not true. And he walks in thinking he's the only one with this issue around intimacy and slowly discovers that, you know, the, the Middle Eastern person has that issue and the white boy who comes from the family has that issue. So how do you communicate intimacy without purposeful silence? Yeah, that, and that, you, you mentioned Beau Travai, you know, the great Claire Denis. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I'm curious, you know, as your first kind of feature, mm. uh, narrative feature, uh, who were kind of your influences in terms of the type of film you wanted to make? Well, I think like one thing I never, I don't get a chance to talk about much is Rocky. Rocky is one of my favorite movies. I've seen that movie probably like- I did not see that one coming. Yeah, I love Rocky. I want, honestly, I, I mean, I went to film school for sure, but one of the things I learned in film school is that if you like something and you want to make something like it, um, another person that's a huge influence on me is um, Hubert Selby, the, the great author. And he learned how to write books by rewriting his favorite books. So when I would watch Rocky, I would do the scene where he's running up the stairs. I would just write it down as I saw it on screen over and over and over again. And, you know, it definitely informed the way that I filmed The Crucible, you know? Um, that's one movie. Um, another movie that's really, it's just kind of like a, a carte blanche influence on me is um, Gio Pontecorvo's Battle of Algiers. Um, I have a kind of, I call, I call it, I have it like cinematic dyslexia, where I don't see a difference between documentary and fiction film. I think that they are two very different processes that in, in the same result, which is a movie, you know? And I think Battle of Algiers is a film that really kind of typifies that. Um, and I'm also very interested in the French New Wave, uh, particularly their editing style. The idea of cutting for emotion and action versus cutting for plot flow, which is kind of like traditional kind of American classic film approach. So, you know, but there's, there's so many more. Paris is Burning is a constant influence on me. Um, uh, Imitation of Life by Douglas Sirk, the Douglas Sirk uh, social, political, family-driven melodrama of the 1950s is a huge influence on me and how I write movies. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a movie fan, you know, I, but ultimately, if you were to ask me to condense this down for a, a ticket buying public, I would say the inspection is gay black Rocky. Go, go get the ticket. <laughs> you know? That's literally the best tagline I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, one of the things that is so interesting, you know, you know, I think it was probably John Houston who said that, you know, 95% of his job was just casting. Yes. And this yes. film, yeah, Jeremy is the anchor of it, but yet it so much depends on having this ensemble mm. uh, work so well, not just, you know, Raul and Gabrielle, but Bokeem Woodbine and all the individual actors that play the individual soldiers, you know, yeah. it creates its own dynamic. So how, how, how did you go about casting this film? Well, first of all, I got to give a massive shout out to Kim Coleman. She is, you know, an iconic casting director who's worked with literally everybody that you can imagine. And she's a family friend. I actually went to film school with her daughter. And so, you know, when I, and when, me and Winter, her daughter are really good friends as well. So I reached out to Kim and she said, yes. So, you know, having someone like that leading the charge is very, very important. Um, but ultimately, I guess from an artistic standpoint to kind of talk about something I get a chance to talk about very often is like, I wanted each recruit 
to be mirrored by a drill instructor, right? I wanted them to kind of have a physical resemblance to one another because, you know, they're kind of two ends of a, of a spectrum of, of, mil, of, you know, the military finishing process. So that mirroring was really important. So that would explain, you know, why Aaron Dominguez had to be casted after Raul was casted and um, McCall and, and, I'm sorry, uh, Harvey and Brooks resemble each other and French and laws kind of sort of resemble one another, you know, so there's that. Um, and then, you know, ultimately what I was really concerned with was like having that Marine Corps feeling, that camaraderie. Like if you see me with my Marine buddies, it, you won't even know what we're talking about. We speak such a, a, a little personal language that we have from the Marine Corps. And I felt like I needed to have, once I got this incredible cast, once I had, you know, Gabrielle Union is somebody that I'm super grateful for. You know, my mom died three days after this movie got greenlit. I'm, my gratitude, Gabby allowed me to, and they all allowed me to process that grief because I was very open about it on set. And, you know, the, every piece of jewelry that Gabby, Gabby wears is my mom's jewelry. Um, the Bible that she uses is my mom's Bible, you know? So I have an intense amount of gratitude to Gabby because she brought my mom back to life. And I wasn't speaking to my mom, you know, when she died. So or rather she wasn't speaking to me. I kept trying to reach out to her, but, um, you know, I got a chance to get some closure that I never would have gotten from my mom through Gabby taking this on, you know, and, and then Bo Keen was just like, honestly, we were doing an exhaustive search. There were a lot of incredible actors who were incredible in the part that reached out, but I grew up on Bo Keen Woodbine. Bo Keen Woodbine is like, you know, eggs and bacon, you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> bread and butter to me, it's like a part of my cinematic lexicon. Um, and when I heard that he had read the script and wanted to play Laws, I called up Effie, you know, Chester's my husband, you know, producing partner. And I called and I just let them know, I'm like, listen, we're done. Bokeem wants to do it, we're done. And to me, Bokeem is like Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Harvey Keitel, like that kind of actor. And if I had, you know, when do you get a chance to work with someone like that? Um, and then for the other pieces, you know, uh, Iman Espondi, I've just never seen anyone as like just enthusiastic. And he's got this like boyish quality in this, but he's also very, very tough too, you know? So I, I wanted to bring him in and Raul, to me, Raul is the Latin Brando as far as I'm concerned. You know, you want that kind of, his, his fiance Alexis calls him a tiger bear. You know, so he's got this ferocity, this austerity that you need to have as a drill instructor, you know, but he also has a real nurturing quality to him. And I, I was just fascinated by that, that kind of dichotomy within the actor. So yeah, that's how the whole movie came together. I, I, last question. I just want to, you know, this could so easily, you know, by more narrow-minded be people be mm. pigeonholed as a certain type of film. Sure. Um, so I guess my last question is, what what do you think is the ultimate universality of this film? And I think you hinted at it at the very beginning. Yeah, you know, I think there's, in terms of universality, first of all, this is a story about the unbreakable bonds between mothers and sons. At the end of the day, every person has tried to seek their parents' validation, and most people fail miserably at it. And somehow, we have to go on with our lives right? We still have to become the best version of ourselves anyway. So there's that element, that thread, you know, um, and when I joined the Marine Corps, I joined after 10 years of being homeless because that I'm gay. My mother kicked me out of the house for being gay. So when I arrived at boot camp, I felt worthless. I felt like my life was unimportant and that I did not matter and that I could never, ever, ever be enough for anyone. And I was fortunate enough to have a drill instructor say to me, you know what? Your life is important. Your life does matter and you are enough because you have a responsibility to protect the Marine to your left and to your right. And that lesson was transformative for me. I, honestly, I ran with it. I ran all the way to this interview with you to this, to, from with that lesson. And in this moment in you know, hit world history, the political history that we're, we're experiencing right now, things are getting very, very polarized and very, very scary. We are depending on third parties to have conversations for us that we could be having across our differences. And that's what I learned in the Marine Corps. My friends, my Marine buddies are so different from me 
One of my good friends is a white guy who voted for Trump the first time. And we're still great friends, you know? And him voting for Trump, man, I would be on the phone with him hours debating, hours. The second time, he didn't vote for Trump, right? When you're in the Marine Corps, you understand, like, listen, like, we have a saying, there's no dark, there's no black or white Marines, only dark green and light green, right? We understand that if, if these bullets come down range and we are at a point of disagreement, how can I trust that you're gonna get my back? You know, we have to find that middle ground. We have to communicate across our differences. So I understand how some people can be um, intimidated by the vessel within which this message comes in, but that doesn't deny its truth. We are all interdependent on one another. And I hope that when people watch this movie, if you've ever felt like you're not enough, if you've ever felt disregarded and underestimated, I hope that by the end of this viewing experience, you're reminded of the power you have, that being your authentic and true self can change the world around you. Because that's what I believe. I believe individuals change institutions. The relationships between individuals shift institutions. And to expect institutions to be different just because of legislation, clearly we're in a moment where legislation is just secondary to the relationships that human beings have. So that human connection is what I'm all about. And I think that's what this movie is all about. And I think that's what makes it universal. Well, uh, elegance, I mean, I could not have said it better myself, and thank you so much as both a, a queer man and the brother of a mar of a Marine. Hoorah! Uh, this, this film spoke to me in a lot of ways. Uh, um, so everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the upcoming awards season, and stay tuned for interviews with more contenders uh, throughout the season. Elegance Bratton, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and thanks to the Gold Derby uh, readers and watchers for checking us out. It's a dream come true. <laughs>